right, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, we're gonna be talking about self-care for ourselves as caregivers for our children and how that gives the best of us to them. So the way we start all of our events for monthly events at Let Grace In. Oops. Oh, sorry, I think that was me. Slides are going. Um, are just to, let me get back to the first one. Let's see, one more. Sorry about that. There we go. All right, so the way we start all of our events um, for monthly events at Let Grace In are with some deep breaths. So I just wanted all of us um, to invite you to close your eyes if that feels comfortable or soften your gaze. And we're gonna take about five deep breaths together. So we just kind of center ourselves into being here and having a moment to being with one another. We just feel the sensation of our breath in our nose and on our throat, filling up our lungs and out. And as we're taking our deep breaths, we maybe think about setting an attention for our time together, whether it be just to take one meaningful thing with us today, whether it be to take care of ourselves by being more compassionate with where we are, and what's happening as you take another deep breath in. Maybe the intention is just to return to the breath when we need to, and just to exhale all that's not serving us. Now why don't we take one more deep cleansing breath in and out again. Okay. And we can open our eyes and come back together. All right, so I wanted to start off with just acknowledging that if you're here as a caregiver or even supporting those who are caregiving, that you're doing hard things. And we're in a time right now in the world where things are hard. And so we just acknowledge um, all that we're going through and the things that we're feeling in this world. And then I'm here just to offer my story and things that had helped me but of course, each and every relationship is completely unique as is every individual and our personalities and the experience that we bring with us from our lives. And so just know that you at the deepest, most whole part of yourself know what's the best for you in your journey. Um, and operating from that actually is something that's been so helpful for me as I navigate mine. Oops. So I want to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, my name is Gabby Govea. Trying to get back onto that slide. <laughs> um, so first of all, I'm a registered nurse for the last 21 years. The first 15 years I've been in the intensive care unit before Grayson got sick. Um, I'm a mom. So there's a a picture of us um, in 2015. My son Grayson in a light blue shirt in the middle. That's my husband Kail, and Olivia. There was only two years old at the time. Um, and then in the upper right, that's our picture. Um, Olivia is now a little bigger. She's eight years old currently, and that's Charlie on the left. She's four years old, um, and Grayson would be 11 years old today. Um, so Grayson had uh, an aggressive brain cancer called glioblastoma and when he was graduating preschool at around five years old um, he was diagnosed and um, glioblastoma is very aggressive and has no standard of care so um, I was the main caregiver I stopped working as a nurse and took care of him for the nine months that you know we were fighting and battling and, and cancer. And then Grayson died in 2016 in January um, and still been a caregiver to my other children and then trying to care for myself the best I can in this grieving journey. And through that journey, 
Uh, my husband and I have founded a nonprofit called Let Grace In. And so I'm gonna share with you a little bit about Let Grace In. We're a 501c3 supporting families, other families like ours after the death of a child. This is a photo of us at our most recent day retreat at Holomua Farms in July. Our mission is to restore hope for bereaved families by building community and fostering physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual well being. Um, we offer hope retreats, monthly therapeutic events, and the grief recovery method. And I'm going to be sharing a little bit about my knowledge after becoming a grief recovery method specialist today um, and sharing just a little bit more about grief, but differently in the way, um, you know, in, in our world, we usually um, equate that with just loss from death. Sorry, my slides are skipping around again. There's a delay, so I think that's why here. Debbie, do you think it's better if you take over? Yeah, that's fine. I can control of the slide. That's fine. Uh, I can control it. Sorry, everybody. Technical difficulties. <laughs> this is the right slide. Yeah, that should be the next one. Okay. So, um, Family Caregiver Alliance, they're online, you can check them out. They share that family caregivers of any age are less likely to practice preventative healthcare and self-care behavior. Regardless of age, sex and race and ethnicity, caregivers report problems attending to their own health and well-being while managing caregiving responsibilities. I mean, any of us who's a caregiver can acknowledge that all of these things are real sleep deprivation, poor eating habits, failure to exercise, failure to stay in bed when ill, postponement or failure to make medical appointments for yourself. So these are all the things that, you know, we're always managing and kind of fighting against to care for ourselves. Okay, can go to the next slide. That's me and Grayson in the hospital. This is just to set up a baseline for why self-care is so important for us. Sorry, I'm trying to change the next slide, but I'm having technical difficulties myself. Oh, there we go. Okay. So caregivers are more likely to have chronic illness. That includes high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and a tendency to be overweight. Studies show that up to 59% of caregivers could be clinically depressed. Um, there are just so many changes. Um, you know, I can remember when Grayson got sick, it's just like your whole life stops. And it's as if the world continues to go around and function the same way around you um, when everything, it's like a bomb has gone off in your life and things are changing. Um, and so there are just so many losses and so many things that differ from the way that we live our lives, um, becoming a caregiver. So it just really makes so much sense just to acknowledge this. We can switch to the next slide. So our goals for today are just to talk about grief more and validate our own losses. Why grief is so misunderstood, we'll talk about that too. And what are our existing beliefs? Um, ways to identify our own unresolved grief and then action steps to move forward. Okay, can turn to the next slide. So I talked about the grief recovery method earlier. It's an evidence-based program. Um, that is action oriented, a way to move through. So I'll be using some of um, the information and the definitions that Grief Recovery, the Grief Recovery Institute uses. So they define grief in a couple of different ways. Um, it is the normal and natural reaction to significant emotional loss of any kind. And so just acknowledging that all these feelings that come up for us when things are changing and feel hard and different are normal and natural. And if you think about a human life from the beginning of time, there has always been birth and death um, and 
really showing up for our lives completely and all of the things is a normal and natural response. So we just acknowledge that there are hard things and then it's normal and natural. So there are actually 43 plus different losses considered to be grief. Um, at the bottom there, I talk about burnout, stress, depression, you know, we call it all different things, but um, they're all actually grief. Most commonly are death, divorce, moving, financial change, either up or down, legal problems, um, having an empty nest, loss of trust and loss of safety are a little more intangible ones. Can move to the next slide. So there's tangible and intangible losses. Another one of the definitions that grief recovery talks about is the conflicting feeling caused by the end of or change in a familiar pattern or behavior. So these conflicting feelings that we have during these changes are actually grief. So as a caregiver, on one hand, caring for our children, our child demonstrates love and commitment, and it can be the most rewarding personal experience. And on the other hand, there is exhaustion and worry, there are inadequate resources, and all of the continuous care demands are just so enormously stressful. So just having those two sit side by side, you know, um, in all relationships, we just acknowledge that so we can move forward as our grief. So unresolved compounded grief, if you think of our lives from the very beginning um, and how this kind of, if you use these definitions of changes, grief starts in childhood. If you imagine them as little rocks that we place into our backpack, it's like, okay, no passy, you know, you can't take your blankie to school, or your dog died, you moved to a new home. So all of these things, if you imagine them as little stones, as collecting them in our backpack, you know, and we talk about it as emotional baggage, that they, they continue to weigh heavy over time. Um, and even the things that we witness, maybe our parents going through, our siblings going through, other friends, um, you know, that can add weight to our backpack too as we move through life. Um, and look at COVID with us witnessing others losing people um, from death, with people's financial situations changing, people just feeling out of control from all the change of doing social activities different, like people can't get married and they go to school different, we go to work different, some of us are working from home, there's so many different changes, everything we do are, is really different. And then witnessing our child go through really difficult, hard things, whether it be physical pain or emotional pain, um, and we can relate to this even outside of caregiving, just witnessing someone we love so much going through just a rough time can also add, you know, emotional burden to us. So we're, we're carrying all of this stuff with us all the time and trying to operate and take care of ourselves. And um, the bad thing or the sad thing is that the world doesn't teach us how to deal with all of these losses in real time. A lot of times it's um, things that have been passed down generationally or that you've heard before in your life that you've passed down or that our parents have taught us through what they believe and what they've been taught. Um, and nobody really shares with us, you know, oh, we're going through all of these hard things. How do we do the emotional work in our life um, to combat, you know, all of this stuff that weighs heavy on us and changes the way that we view the world and live in our world. Okay, can go to the next slide. So as I was talking about, um, there are a lot of attitudes and beliefs um, which form personal barriers that stand in the way of taking care of ourselves. So um, you know, we go along as kids and throughout our life and people are like, oh, don't feel bad. It's going to be okay. You know, like, um, be strong. You have to be strong for yourself and your family. You have to be strong for your spouse or for your child. Um, but basically, that's just 
allow not allowing us to have any sense that it's okay to allow us to move through and process our feelings. Um, Grieve alone is, you know, when we're kids, it's like, oh, you're going to cry and do that. Just go to your room. I don't want to see you. And we tend to grow up with the belief of thinking like, oh, I have to keep all of this bad stuff. People only want to see my happy face. So like, I'm going to keep all of this really deep down pain to myself. I'll cry alone or I'll wait till it's the right time for to feel my feelings. Keep busy. That's another one. Where it's like, okay, if we keep busy, we do feel better temporarily, right? We're keeping busy and we have our mind occupied. But the truth is when we stop, those things all just kind of are still there and come up. Um, and they're still they're present in our life and come out in ways maybe we know or not know. Um, and then people just want to say, it's okay, it'll get better, you know. And time alone actually doesn't really help us feel any better. The truth is the emotional work and the grief work and the work that we do in ourselves in that time is actually what makes the difference. So there's kind of a piece missing in there. It's like, it'll be okay, you know, just just, just keep going and don't worry. It'll, it'll eventually, you know, work itself out. But the truth is it's the actions we take within that time that really make a difference. So the other thing we're gonna acknowledge here is, is grief is emotional not logical. So although these kinds of things, some of them may be true, uh, where you know you do want to keep functioning, so you try to be strong, that the emotional component of it, you know, is like, yeah, but let's not just keep all of that heavy stuff in there. Like we know we have to do what we need to do in our life and continue to function. But um, this, these things here are, are just for us to acknowledge, like, what are our beliefs? And what have we been taught? And then what are the things that are actually really helpful? Are these things helpful to me or not? So these are just things to, to think about. And we can go to the next slide. So I'm gonna talk about short-term energy relieving behaviors. Um, you know, so much of this um, emotional weight and grief that we're talking about builds up in our lives and creates this full energy within our bodies. And we naturally know that we need to release some of that energy and for us to, to be able to somehow, um, you know, we want to feel better. And so the tools that we have don't always work, but this is also acknowledging what are some of the things that we do in our life that maybe are temporarily relieving some of this grief and pain and heartache that we have, but that don't actually work long-term. So STIRBs are short-term energy relieving behaviors. Um, family caregivers are also increased risk for excessive use of alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs. So those are three of the, the STIRBs that we can use. Um, and, you know, people with really good intention and even ourselves are like, oh, I just need to have a drink um, or let's just go out for drinks and we'll feel better, you know, or like use some of these things that are listed here. Um, almost everyone can relate to watching Netflix marathons or scrolling on your phone or engaging in any of the things on our electronics and movies, um, food, eating, um, shopping, um, also called um, retail therapy, um, exercise, this can be one of them too. There are a lot of other things um, that can be used as short-term energy relieving behaviors. And this is not for us to feel bad about. This is not for us to just, you know, call ourselves out and say like, oh, shucks, I wish I wasn't doing any of these or using any things of these things. Cause really the truth is we all have these things in our life. This is just a call acknowledgement upon them. So maybe when we're engaging in some of these activities um, to, do that energy relieving behavior, we can just acknowledge like, hey, you know, what am I really going through? What are the things that are really coming up for me right now that I feel like I need to disturb in this way? Um, what are the things that feel like they're really helpful and how can I really like think about them on a deeper level and just acknowledge what's happening? So that's the point of us about talking about disturbs. Okay, you can go to the next slide, please. So in grief recovery, they also talk about um, Academy Award grieving. 
So often caregivers, you know, because we're told to be strong and grieve alone, that we can also, you know, not acknowledge all of the deep heaviness that we're going through. And actually, this has a lot to do with the way that our society holds us or doesn't hold us. Um, there aren't a lot of safe spaces where people can really, um, I think, hear exactly what you're going through and know how deeply painful it is for you and um, know how to hold a safe space. Um, in grief recovery, we call it a heart with ears where you just are present and listen. Um, and those are hard skills to acquire in our world that doesn't really give us a lot of good teaching tools on how do we hold that space for one another. So we often as caregivers say, oh, it's okay, we're okay, you know, and, and we try to just um, move on the best we can, um, but truly we're hurting inside and we just want others to feel comfortable. Um, oftentimes caregivers don't accept help um, which is common. I can relate to every single one of these things going through um, my journey with Grayson when he was sick, when we were in the hospital. It's so overwhelming. Um, you don't want to burden someone else. You're going through all of this for the very first time. Um, and you, there's no, just like parenting, there's no handbook. There's no way to like go through and to feel um, like, you know, you're always thinking you want to do it right and be doing things in a way where people feel okay too and you're taking care of a lot of other people's feelings. Um, but today, between us, um, I want us to just acknowledge how can we be a little more emotionally honest um, as we go through all this painful, hard stuff that we're going through and how do we express the feelings inside with one another? So what does that look like? Um, and these are just a couple of examples. You have your own language and personality to come up with, but when people are asking us how we're doing, I'm showing up for today, but I really need a break. You know, or I've been better, but I've been worse. Um, could you bring by some groceries today? Or whatever it is that you need, you know, like, oh, I need some help with some laundry. Would you like to just come over and have lunch so we can talk and like do a few loads? Or um, would you allow me to take a nap while you just come over and hang out with Grayson for a little while because I'm feeling really full and I'm afraid that it's affecting the way that I'm communicating with him or it's trying my patience with my other kids. Um, or could you help me pick up the kids or do something else? So these are things that um, we can just, you know, take note of, acknowledge, think about, um, and, and see if that feels like it's helpful for us. Okay, I can go to the next slide. So we base our behavior and the things that we choose to do on our beliefs. Um, so isn't it funny that we hold tight to our old belief systems, which I think this is kind of funny, it shortens to BS, <laughs> that we've been taught even though they don't work. So like things, things that we're doing may not be working for us and maybe we're even aware of that or maybe we're not aware of that, but then we continue to do them over and over in a pattern. Um, old beliefs can cause caregivers to continually attempt to do what cannot be done, to control what cannot be controlled. And the result is feeling a continued failure, frustration, and often an inclination to ignore our own needs. I can definitely relate to this, um, especially wanting to control what cannot be controlled. And I think there is definitely um, a space for me that was like so difficult and wanting to research everything and think up everything um, to figure out a way, you know, to get Grayson better or to do something um, that hadn't been thought of. Um, and I think that's totally normal and natural. And I think that um, I'm glad that I did those things because it helped me to find some peace, you know. Um, at the end, you know, I had to really acknowledge that I was not in control, that I didn't make the decisions whether or not he was going to live or not. Um, and that I could only do what I could do and that I could only 
be a version of myself um, that was surrendered to the life that I had at that moment and to be with him. Um, and I think that that was really, truly um, one of the most <sighs> difficult and helpful um, healing spaces for me to contemplate and go to and be in. Um, but all this stuff is just so much hard work. Today, we just want to acknowledge, you know, what are our beliefs and then how is that affecting the things that we do in our life? If we want to change our behaviors, we need to change our knowledge, our attitudes, our beliefs, and then the behaviors we will follow. Okay, sorry, go ahead. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so you know you ride the airplane and it says, put your oxygen mask on before putting your child's oxygen mask on. I used to sit in the plane and think like, what? Why would I do that? I'm going to put theirs on first. Are you kidding me? But when you really think about it, that is our instinct as a parent, right? As a mother, we want to like take care of them, all of their needs, make sure everything is absolutely right with them. And we come last, we come second. Um, but if we think about that, what good are we to them if we have no oxygen and we're passed out and we're on the floor? Um, and they've got their oxygen on, but they're also alone and scared and we're no longer, you know, then they're worried about us or whatever, if we're thinking about the plane. But um, so let's just think about this for a second. Put on your oxygen before putting your child on. So this is what we're talking about when we talk about self-care. Okay, and for a lot of us, not taking care of ourselves might be a lifelong pattern. Taking care of others sometimes can be an easier option than actually taking care of ourselves. Um, I know that I've always been a people pleaser growing up. I'm a caregiver. I chose that for my profession. Um, and I still feel that way that a lot of times that I'm always worried about other people and that it's really taken some time for me to like, have a good sit down with myself and decide that I'm worth it and important enough to take care of myself. And I think, um, you know, it says breaking old patterns and overcoming obstacles is not an easy proposition for sure, but it can be done. Um, and I think that over time in tiny, tiny increments that when we put our best intention out there to say like, yes, I do want this for myself. I do want to take better care of myself. I do want to speak to myself more kindly. I do want to drink more water. I do want to do these things for myself so that I can be the best parent, caregiver, spouse, um, citizen um, possible. So we do have to sit with ourselves and identify what can be changed and what cannot be changed. Or what are things that you feel like maybe are a can, right? What, what little thing doesn't feel scary to change? Um, getting one more hour of sleep, um, drinking a glass of water in the morning before I get up, um, stopping to take some deep breaths. I mean, we can even program our watches these days to tell us when to do that. Um, so you choose, you get to identify what is the thing that you're gonna, the tiny little bit that doesn't feel scary or overwhelming that you're gonna do. And then finally, we can only change ourselves. We cannot change another person. So what a big concept that is. I feel like <laughs> it's taken me a long time to, to figure out and actually really take in and internalize um, this fact, but it's true. Um, and even in the state of the world as it is right now, so we cannot change anybody else's beliefs, the way they're living, their decisions, and what they're doing around us, which are really truthfully pretty stressful. Um, and when you're the main caregiver, sometimes you wish somebody knew that you needed help in this way, or you wish that people would um, you know, be able to read your mind, which sounds ridiculous, but it's true. Like, People have no idea what we're going through because they've never been us. And it's completely unreasonable for us to expect change um, from other people in a way that they would know exactly how we feel 
and what we're experiencing at the time, right? Because as we've talked about, we have different personalities, different relationships, different um, backgrounds that we come with in our life experience. So all those things complicate things. Okay. Hey, Grayson. I love seeing his picture. He was probably around um, two or three years old when we took this. So Grayson's life and his death have invited me to live differently in my own life. And so I'm here to testify that slow, steady steps forward eventually brings big changes. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard the butterfly effect, but um, I just want to acknowledge, I saw this quote and I can't remember it verbatim right now, but it's like a lot of people admire the butterfly and all of its beauty, but Little is said about all of the work and transformation that goes into creating that beautiful, wonderful creature. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of metamorphosis um, talked about with the, the transformation of the butterfly, but for good reason, because that little caterpillar eats and eats and eats and eats. And I think about this as each little bite, you know, more knowledge or um, another podcast or listening to somebody else who's been there before or um, absorbing something um, at a, you know, a seminar, a talk at church, all these places that we go and we bite off little bits of information and education and we fill ourselves with the good things, the healthy green leaves. And then we go into a cocoon and there's a portion of this time nobody really sees of being able to um, go to complete mush. So um, the butterfly, I don't know if you know, the caterpillar actually goes to like complete mush. It's not still the caterpillar on the inside. Um, and eventually it breaks out into a beautiful uh, butterfly. But um, this is just to say that slow, steady steps eventually can bring about big change. And so it doesn't feel like it in the process when we're all mush, but um, slow, steady bits of information or things that we do to work on ourselves or good habits eventually at some point start to feel different. Um, intentional living is the action that we can take when everything feels out of control. So if we focus on the things that we do have control over, right? And we get to choose what are the little things that we get to choose and without really criticizing ourselves for not doing it perfectly or messing up one day or totally falling off the bandwagon. Um, but just with patience and grace for ourselves. Um, one of my favorite moms who has a son who had congenital heart disease and passed away and she has a, another um, son with um, medical complications um, and more long-term, she's a long-term caregiver for another son. She says, we are made for our lives. Somewhere deep down inside, we have this life. And the truth is that we were made to live this life, no matter how difficult or um, hard it feels is that somehow deep down inside in the truest parts of ourselves, we can realize that we are, we are made for our lives, that we can do hard things and that we can live this life um, in an intentional way. Um, and that all of this uncomfortable stretching and growing is actually in a way for us. And that it has the infinite potential to change us. And we get to choose. And we get to choose for how long, um, you know, whether we're, you know, biting off tiny bits every day or a tiny bit once a month. Um, you know, it's just something to think about. So the other thing that I wanted to share in this um, is that my internal world is the real is real life. What that means is it is what drives me in the external reality. So we talked about what kind of beliefs that we hold for ourselves and, and what this emotional work looks like um, drives our behaviors. And the way to wholeness is to actually just go inward and to change internally. So 
I think this is to say that my biggest self-care survival tip is to just intentionally and continually in tiny, tiny increments continue to do the internal emotional work. And sometimes that, most times that's the hardest work that we do. It's the work that we don't wanna do. It's the work that's easy to avoid and, um, and delay till tomorrow or the next time. And that's why, you know, when we set workout goals in the new year or things that we're gonna do, they kind of eventually fade over time. But I think always bringing our back, back, bringing ourselves back to how can I do a tidbit of emotional work on myself today and acknowledge what's going on is like so important. Um, and I think this is the single most um, helpful survival tool um, that I've used while Grayson had cancer and was sick and was in pain and witnessing all of those things that I was completely out of control um, changing. And, and then once he died, handling this grief and living with this um, physical absence of my precious child, how um, to move forward when it feels impossible, how to um, live life when you just really don't want to live anymore or it seems reasonable to check out, you know, um, and it's hard work, but just to consider um, all that discomfort as um, change and being muck is the stage that holds the infinite potential of us turning into a beautiful butterfly. Okay, can you go to the next stage slide? Okay, so a lot of these things that I'm going to share now are things that you've probably heard before, um, but maybe sometimes we absorb things um, slowly or maybe at the time that you hear it, it's not the right thing. And maybe today one of these things will be something that you feel like you can do. Take breaks. It's essential to regularly schedule a few times a week, even just for an hour or two, you can get away while either a family member, a friend, or a health aide stays with your child. Um, this is so hard to ask for sometimes too. And we feel so obligated. For me, I felt like this as a mother to like be the one who is like always there. And especially because I know him best and I'm the one who does everything for him. And I'm the one who's gonna be able to give him the best care. But um, you know what the truth is, like we talked about, we put on our oxygen mask first. Once away, that time is yours. So don't feel guilty about how you spend it. Even if you're starving, it's fine. Nap, read, have coffee with a friend, go shopping. Um, listen to music at 70 beats per minute. So there's all these things that help um, our physical body kind of like come down. And we experience the deep breathing exercises at the beginning as one of the first things that helps our fight or flight part of our body kind of come down and um, calm down again. So I didn't know this. Listening to music at 70 beats per minute helps your body physically, physiologically calm your heartbeat will try to match the music at 70 beats. And so this is something that's super easy. Um, I haven't ever Googled it, but I should like, what are the songs that are 70 beats a minute? And then just make a whole playlist of that and then call it your like calm playlist and, and do that. It's like one of the probably easiest ways with music being therapeutic too, to like help yourself calm. Get a mobile massage. Oh my goodness, have somebody come to your home safely in COVID, all of those things, of course. Um, have a weekly therapy session with a counselor that you trust. This is huge for me. Um, as soon as Grayson got diagnosed, um, I hooked up with a therapist at Kapiolani and I saw her every two weeks. Um, when Grayson died, I saw her every week. And this was like essential for me to have a safe space and to force myself to have this special time dedicated to myself, to take time to talk about things that were coming up, things that I was fearing about the future, um, just to be with somebody that I trusted 
that could help, you know, talk me through like things I could do and just relieve myself of the burden of, you know, all of those things that were weighing heavy on me. Um, engage in a guided meditation. Now there are tons of apps that have meditations. Um, taking a walk, you can also listen to a meditation as you walk or use your walk as a guided meditation and combination. So up here on the screen, um, this My Life Meditation app is the one that I use and I use it with my children too. So if you have other kids, there's great um, bulldog sessions for children that they can do at bedtime that and they're also talking about all the things that are coming up in the world. So there are specific ones for um, racial tension, um, like just everything that's coming up and how we're um, responding. There's a lot of things that are, are on this app that you, know, you can kind of scroll through and see how that identifies um, and where you are actually in your life as well too. Okay, you can move on to the next slide. Look at that guy in that hammock. So I was um, looking for some respite options for families who don't have family, because how can you get a break when you know you don't have anybody? And so um, I haven't used all of these support systems personally, and some of them, as you can see, are in like Hilo and Kona and Lehue. So this is generally for Hawaii, um, and they talk about hugs here. I have used their respite. Um, they would take the kids. Um, and have like a one-on-one, -on -one, um, um, they would have usually nursing students be the the one-on-one -on -one, um, like caretaker for your child um, at the time, during that time that they were spent, they would feed them and they would play games and they would have, you know, that individualized attention and care um, from somebody who was somewhat medical trained um, for any of your other children or even your sick child as well. Um, so that is one of the, um, the resources on here that I have used, but I just um, thought that maybe this would be interesting for people who wanted to know what resources are available um, in Hawaii if they don't have anybody to relieve them for respite. Okay, you can go on to the next slide. Eat well. Who hasn't heard this before? Choosing something healthy first thing in the morning helps us choose well for the rest of the day. Um, and you know, that can be as simple as like getting up and having a glass of water first thing before you do anything else in the morning. Um, that's become one of my rituals where I squeeze a lemon or a lime and something. And I've heard this from um, holistic practitioners too and Eastern medicine practitioners that this helps keep your body, you know, of course hydrated, but then also regular um, and helps your gut health. And then a little bit of vitamin C and a citrus, um, you know, lime or lemon or something like that will, will help. Um, so that might be one thing that you can take away from today that helps um, because it's really difficult to just really all of a sudden go vegan. Um, and so I would recommend just doing something tiny itty bitty um, first. So it's no surprise that living on coffee and picking at hospital leftovers can leave you feeling tired and run down, of course. If friends offer to help you bring homemade meals to your home, take them up on it. Um, and you can even mention to them too, I know this feels kind of forward, but like, oh, I'm really trying to like get all my vegetables in, or if there's any new recipes, you know, that you know of that um, include a lot of new veggies, like that's what I've been into lately, trying to take care of myself. Um, and then just drinking water in general. So start with half your body weight in ounces per day. And that's generally um, a good amount of water to get if you're not exercising or something just as a general baseline. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Move your body. You've heard this one before too, right? Um, and really decide what it is for you that feels right. A walk, a bike ride, yoga, um, all of these things can help clear the mind, boost your energy and re re improve sleep, right? So you can kind of like get two in one. Um, and this is a great like big energy exercise that relieves all of those like inner emotional grief feelings that we were talking about. You can start with 10 minutes. So um, 
during COVID, we like extended our Apple account, whatever. We don't have cable to like include Apple Fitness, which was, was like five bucks more or something. I don't know, depending on whatever plan. I'm not the techie person my husband is. Um, and they have 10 minute sessions for pretty much all of the, the little move your body um, sections that they have, including if you want it to be really intense, hit a high intensity um, or just yoga, a mindful cool down that you can do. Um, and then if that even feels difficult, include your kids, have a dance party, turn on fun music. Um, I, I recently um, had my kids kids listen to Ice Ice Babies. You guys remember that song from way back when? And it just has like such a fun, catchy beat. And then now my four-year-old's like, put on Ice Ice Baby. So you could just have those like fun moments where you just like really decide like, okay, for 10 minutes, we're just going to have a dance party. And the child that you're caring for, include them. You know, like even if they're in bed or they're unable to move, they can still laugh and move or use their fingers or maybe their eyes or something Um you know, to engage and it really helps like in the mood and get your body moving. Um, okay, chores counts as moving your body, but boo, that's kind of not fun. But sometimes they help you feel like, oh, my space is cleaner and I'm burning some calories at the same time. So maybe just shifting the perspective on that, like, oh, I'm cleaning all this stuff up, but I'm also getting my 10, 15, half an hour moving my body time in. Um, gardening that has the added um, benefit as like getting your fingers in the dirt and growing something and seeing progress happening um, or perhaps maybe the child that you're taking care of can go for the walk with you or maybe you can take them in the stroller or your wheelchair or whatever it is that that you have to help them get out breathe the air get some vitamin d absorb the sun like observe the animals along the way you know um, exercise helps to reduce um, psychological tension. Walking 20 minutes a day, three times a week is very beneficial. That, that would be a goal. Research shows that physical fitness boosted self-esteem and mental toughness. This is challenging for me, but I'm trying all the tiny itty bitty ways to move my body more. Okay, you can go on to the next slide. Find a support group. This may or may not be for you. This is for not for everyone this personally helps me a lot to just be with other people who understood um, and it's actually what we offer at let grayson for other grieving families um hugs why i talked about them earlier um that is not um a group support situation where you sit in a circle and you take time to share it's kind of more of like over a meal or an activity that you're doing things mom's mom's night dad's night um family dinner night um, close friends and family, that's a support group. Get together. Our family does Sunday dinners every Sunday. We look forward to that. We catch up with one another. We eat really incredible food. And um, it's just that time that we look forward together, all of us as a family, to just to make time and decide that we're going to be together. It's one of my favorite family traditions. So if you feel more comfortable sharing anonymously or online, there's apps. So there's families that have told me they use this app called Peanut. Um, and you can have your own chat group around whatever your special interest is, or maybe around what you're going through with your child. Um, and so, you know, things like this that are virtual, there's also apps and other things and, you know, support groups like on Facebook and things that you can participate and maybe read from the sideline if you're not really like an active um, participant. So the important thing is to get beyond the feeling of isolation by reaching out to others who've been in your shoes. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Okay, seek knowledge. So there's a lot of other people who have gone before us that have done this um, podcast. I love podcasts. Find the people that resonate with you. Books, audiobooks um, are the easiest way for me to any read any books. Those things always feel good in my body. Instagram feeds, there may be people who are um, trained in child psychology or things that feel helpful or, um, you know, people who have feeds that resonate in the caregiving um, arena, educational seminars, um, if that feels possible. And now with virtual stuff, it's a lot easier to attend seminars online. Okay, can go to the next slide. 
So the grief recovery method, this is um, what I've been talking about. It's evidence-based. Um, they're online. There's different groups um, that you can attend. This is something that you can do. It helps complete the emotional pain of relationships. So it helps you kind of really do the emotional work in a um, very strategic, written with homework. You read a book, you do the activities. Um, and it's the eight-week group is evidence-based. All the other programs are um, focused around that evidence-based program. You can ask me more about that if you're interested. You can go to the next slide. Um, so there's things online. So powerful tools for caregivers. There's virtual classes. This is one that's coming up. It's also um, on from the mainland. So this is just some information. Um, the things on the left are the things that they help reduce stress, improve self-confidence, manage time, set goals, better communicate your feelings. And then on the right, um, it's a two-hour class for caregivers of children with specific health or behavioral needs. Um, this is, I've never done this before. This is just one of the classes that are out there online that I found, powerful tools for caregivers. I emailed them um, and that this is available virtually. So this is another resource for you. You can go to the next slide. Um, and there's interactive sessions as well. So the, the next one coming up is Let's Get Away Together um, on September 28th. And they're doing summer in Ireland. So there's Zoom meetings and it's, it's for caregivers. Um, and so you'll learn, you'll do some interactive stuff. Um, so each week they're focusing on something new and there'll be a follow-up message with tips, activities, and recipes for families to continue to enjoy after your um, experience. And it's supposed to be an enjoyable activity for family caregivers and the person that you care for. Um, so this might be something also virtually that you tap into and just know that there's other resources out there. This is also not local. And so one of my most favorite um, pieces of advice is just to be fully present with your child. So um, I remember just being with Grayson and just breathing him in and just holding hands and laying together even quietly and just um, having those moments and just savoring one another, um, just allowing each other to know that we love one another and that we're in it together, that we're both, you know, um, feeling whatever we're feeling around everything that was going on, that, that the love really just um, ele elevated us beyond all those hard feelings and things that we are going through and feeling. So I love you, Grayson. Okay, can you go to the next slide? I think we should be done. So here's my contact information. If anybody wants to email me, give us a call. You can check out Let Grayson's um, website there, letgrayson.org. 